believers. Because we believe, don't we? If you'd like to follow along today in your Bibles uh, or your device or whatever you happen to be using today, it's Matthew chapter 26. We'll be receiving communion at the end of the service today. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness, for forgiveness of sins. Now, we celebrate two sacraments in the Church of the Nazarene. Some, some churches sac, uh, celebrate more. We celebrate baptism, which is a sacrament of identification. And we celebrate the Lord's Supper, which is a sacrament of commemoration. Speaking of baptism, if there are those who uh, are saved but have not been baptized, we want to have a baptism real soon. So uh, get with me on that, and we'll get that taken care of. Also, February 18th is Membership Sunday, and if you are a Christian and you've never officially joined this church, we'd love for you to become an official office-holding, voting member of Banner Church. Communion. Sometimes we call it the Lord's Supper, and that's probably the most famous painting of the Lord's Supper, and that was done by Leonardo da Vinci, and uh, it's called the Last Supper. I always wondered why they all ate on the same side of the table. Seems awful crowded over there, doesn't it? <laughs> There's a lot of art lessons to learn from that uh, painting as far as linear perspective and all of that, but I'm not here to go into that today. Uh, the Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper, sometimes called communion. If you use the word communion, it uh, refers to the fact that we are one at one table. Communion comes from the word common. Some churches call it the Holy Eucharist. If you came from a more liturgical type church, maybe they called it the Holy Eucharist, uh, which has to do with giving thanks. And Jesus took the bread and the fruit of the vine, and he gave thanks. Whatever you uh, call it, it has its origins in the Passover meal. If you're not familiar with the Passover, I've taken Exodus chapter 12, and I've kind of condensed it just a little bit and left out a few words that uh, aren't real essential to the story. And I'll just go through that real quickly. Exodus chapter 12, if you want to turn to it. The Lord said that each man is to take a lamb for his family. The animals you choose must be without defect. That is significant because they need to be perfect lambs. And the community of Israel is to slaughter them. Then they're to take the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. They're to eat the meat along with bread made without yeast. So you have blood across the top and sides of the door, and you're to eat the meat with bread made without yeast. That's significant. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt, strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. I will bring judgment on Egypt. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. We used to sing a hymn in the church, when I see the blood, I will pass. I will pass over you. That's why we call it the Passover. When the blood was applied, the death angel passed over and did not harm anyone in that household. And so the, the symbolism there is it's just thick with symbolism. And the blood of Jesus Christ applied to the heart, to our hearts. The second death cannot touch us. All coming from this uh, account of the Passover. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is another term for the Passover, because it was on this day that I brought you out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once, select the animals for your families, and slaughter the Passover lamb. Jesus is our Passover lamb. 
Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood, put some on the top and on both sides of your door frame. Not one of you shall go out the door of this house until morning. They were only safe as long as they were covered by the blood. Somebody ought to write a song. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. He will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. That's what Jesus was doing in the picture that we just saw. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you then tell them. It's the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt, spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn of Egypt. So that's kind of a condensed version of uh, Exodus chapter 12, giving us the background for communion. As I said, in our text, Jesus was celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Passover, with his disciples. He took the unleavened bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he said, Take this and eat it. This is my body. My body, which is broken for you. You see, up until this point, they had used a Passover lamb. Well, Jesus is that Passover lamb. They were looking forward to that once and for all sacrifice on the cross. And Jesus said, I am he. After they had taken the bread, he took the cup that contained the fruit of the vine. He held it up before them and blessed it. He instructed them to drink it because it represented the blood of the new covenant. There was an old covenant, the sacrificial system, where the blood of animals was shed. But he said, this is a new covenant. That was shed for the remission of sins. The bread was unleavened and the juice was unfermented. Which indicates that communion is about holiness. It's about holiness. When the Lord came to Moses, he said no leaven is to be used. In other words, no yeast. When the Passover is celebrated, they use unleavened bread. There's no leaven in the food, the drinks, and in the house. It had to go completely throughout the house. If there was any trace of any kind of leaven, any kind of leavened bread, as much as a crumb, it had to be removed because leaven is a symbol or a type of sin. It represents sin. And that's why it had to be removed. And that's why communion is about holiness. The word wine, you may, may have noticed. I have refrained from using the word wine. Wine is not used in reference to the Lord's Supper. It's referred to as the fruit of the vine. And if you want to mark these scriptures down, Mark 14, 25, Luke 22, 18, in both cases, it's called the fruit of the vine. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, he referred to it as this cup. To celebrate Passover in accordance to the law given in the book of Exodus, they would have used unfermented juice. Why? Because fermentation is a form of decay, which is symbolic of sin. If leaven represents sin, unleavened bread represents the body of Christ without sin. There could be no sin in his body if he was to be a perfect, acceptable sacrifice. See, that's why all of us fall short. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We couldn't atone for our sin if, even if we tried. We could offer ourselves on an altar to be sacrificed. We could actually shed our own blood, and it wouldn't be enough because we are imperfect. We are blemished. We have sinned. So that's why it was necessary for Jesus to come, and uh, he was tempted in every way like we are, but without sin. And that's the only way that he could be a sinless acceptable sacrifice. So unfermented juice was used to represent his pure blood that would atone for the sins of the world. So the bread that we use does not contain yeast and the juice is not fermented because they are a representation of the body and blood of Christ. So it's a reminder of Christ's death 
as the Passover lamb. It's a reminder of God's holiness, and it's a reminder of our sinfulness. Isaiah 6, starting with verse 1. Isaiah caught a glimpse of the Lord. He said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, Holy, Holy. In the scriptures, when, when you hear a word three times, that means to infinity, to the nth degree. Holy, holy, holy is never used for anything other than God. They were crying, holy, holy, holy. He's holy to the nth degree. He's holy to infinity. There is no sin or impurity in him. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me. That was his response. When he caught a glimpse of God, he also caught a glimpse of his self in comparison, and he said, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So he caught a glimpse of God, and then he caught a glimpse of himself. And in comparison to God's holiness, his, his majesty, and his power, and his love, and I'm a man of unclean lips. You know, I thought I was a pretty, I'm a, you know, Isaiah, he was a prophet. He was a man of God. He was doing all the right stuff. But when he caught a glimpse of God, he realized all the right stuff wasn't enough. It, wasn't, it didn't matter how much he cleaned up. It wasn't good enough. Because God is holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah caught a glimpse of that, and he became aware of his own need for cleansing. In the presence of God, we too come to understand our need for forgiveness and cleansing. Well, the good news is he's made a remedy. Because in verses 6 and 7, it goes on to say, The seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. See, that's what happens when we come to Christ. He is our Passover lamb. He is priest and sacrifice. He offers his own sinless self to atone for our sins as a Passover lamb. But not only that, he also serves as scapegoat because he takes away our sin from us. Just like the scapegoat in ancient Israel took the sin away from the people. So we celebrate all of that today. The Lord's Supper is a reminder of Christ's death as the Passover lamb. It's a reminder of God's holiness. It's a reminder of our unworthiness. So, if we are to partake of these elements today, we, we must have our sins forgiven. This is His table. The feast is for His disciples. If our sins have been forgiven, if we are Christians, if we have been saved, we also need to examine ourselves for any unconfessed sin. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, Paul says, A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast. Remember, yeast is a type of sin. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old yeast, not with sin in our heart, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the bread without yeast, unleavened, free of corruption, the bread of sincerity and truth. Well, Paul is saying, get rid of the yeast. How could I do that? I can't forgive myself. I can't cleanse myself. I can't work hard enough. I can't be good enough. What do I do? The good news is he's already dealt with it. We confess our sins. In other words, that word means to agree with. 
we agree with the charges against us. If you were asked to sign a confession, there would be a list of charges against you, and if you signed that confession, you admit and you agree with those charges. That's what it means to confess. That's when you come to God and you say, yes, Lord, I agree. I am a sinner. I've sinned. I've fallen short. So that's the first step. And we repent of that sin. We turn from it. We don't excuse it. Like I heard a fellow on TV the other night. He said, well, I didn't mean to lose my temper, but he provoked me. That's not a confession. That's a rationalization. That's a justification. Yeah, but you don't know what they said to me. You don't know what I've been. You don't know the stress. You don't. That's not a confession. A confession says, I agree. I'm guilty. No ands, ifs, or buts. No justifications. No rationalizations. I am guilty guilty. I cast myself on the mercy of the heavenly court. We confess our sin. And according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess, He is faithful and just to forgive. And not only to forgive us of our sins, but to cleanse us, to purge us, to sanctify us from all unrighteousness. For He is our scapegoat. He takes away our sin. We're to be as pure as the bread and the juice. If there's sin in our lives, we need to confess it so that He can forgive and cleanse. So communion is a reminder of Christ's death. It's a vision of God's holiness, a reminder of our sinfulness, and it's a time for evaluation. Reminds me of Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God. Have you ever prayed that prayer sincerely? If you haven't, you should. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, a true follower of Christ has that attitude. If there's anything that's contrary to His will and His way, if there's anything in our lives that's displeasing to Him, we want to know about it so that we can confess it and get rid of it. So I close the message this morning with four very important biblical truths from this text. Number one, the incarnation. Jesus said, this is my body. He didn't say this is another Passover lamb. He said, this is my body. Almighty God became a man, and He offered Himself as a sacrifice. John 1.14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Number two, His suffering. He took the bread and He broke it. He broke it. Matthew 27.26, they had Jesus flogged, handed Him over to be crucified, stripped Him, put a scarlet robe on Him twisted together a crown of thorns, set it on his head, put a staff in his hand, knelt in front of him, mocked him. They spit on him, took the staff, struck him in the head over and over. They had him mocked. They took off the robe, put on his own clothes. They led him away to crucify him. None of us have ever experienced anything even approaching the torture that Jesus experienced. And the significant thing about it is he broke it. He gave his life. No one took it from him. John 10, 17, 18. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. Pilate thought he had Jesus right here in the palm of his hand. <laughs> and Jesus said, no. Nobody takes my life. I lay down my life. I give my life and I take it up again. I have authority to lay it down, authority to take it up. Number three, his substitutionary death. Verse 28 says, my blood is poured out for many. The hymn, my faith has found a resting place, says, I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. 
Isaiah 53 says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us. Substitutionary death. Hebrews 10.10, we've been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down. Priest didn't sit down. You didn't sit down as a priest because your work was never done. When it was your time to be the priest to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people, you didn't sit down. Jesus did because... It was finished. The once and for all sacrifice had been given. The price had been paid. The sin of all mankind had been atoned for. That's why he could set down, because his job was finished. And then, finally, the invitation. Verse 26 says, take and eat. Do you realize what a blessing it is to be invited to the Lord's table? What an honor it is. As you partake of the elements today, let your mind think back of all of the heroes of the faith, all of the martyrs, all of the ones that suffered and died and sacrificed, all of the faithful ones that are in that great cloud of witnesses that made it possible for us to assemble today in freedom, without fear, and come to the Lord's table as a body of believers. What a blessing. What an honor. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. John six thirty five. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go grow hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And he invites us. Now, I'd like for all heads to be bowed and eyes closed. I want to have a moment of examination. First of all, if you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, you can do that right now. Right now, where you are. Admit you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe that Jesus is that Savior, the Son of God. Confess your sins to Him and trust Him to forgive you. Commit your life to following Him. You can do that right now. You don't have to come to an altar. There may be Christians who have unconfessed sin. Maybe you're harboring bitterness, malice, unconfessed sin. You can confess that right now and prepare yourself to receive this sacrament. Shall we pray? Father, we're so thankful for the invitation to come today and celebrate this sacrament with you, with these who are here, and with all the saints of all the ages from that night so many years ago. We just pray, Lord, that you would forgive us where you, we fail you, where we fall short. We pray, Lord, that you would cleanse us and prepare us to approach your table today in Jesus' name. And before you raise your heads, I wonder if anyone by uplifted hand would say that I prayed that prayer of salvation today. Is there anyone that said, I committed my life to the Lord today? Anyone? All right, I'm going to ask.